about how about dreams turning into reality at Michigan's summer football camp? Our next guest had that experience because I, I, I guess so they say. I don't know if it's myth slash legend or if it's indeed fact that one of the all time camp performances was turned in by what Mr. Marcus Ray. Marcus, is that true? Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that, Sam. Uh, about 21 years ago, I stepped onto the great University of Michigan football campus as an, un, an, an unheard of, unrecognized junior, and then I left this camp as a national recruit. So, and everything else will speak for itself. But yeah, I had one of the greater performances here. But I, I, I had a lot of guys. Jansen was there, and Mark Campbell and a bunch of the other guys I played with also were at the same camp. Yeah, yeah, man. The camp has uh, for for years, or historically, been a a huge recruiting tool for Michigan. So you know how significant the camp can be for for future Michigan athletes, but it can be significant for all of those kids. And and you address them. So if you can for a moment, obviously you don't have enough time to go through your whole speech, but just give us the the tone, the message that you tried to convey to those kids as you got up and, and addressed them at, at camp earlier this week. The tone and the message and the approach that I used yesterday had a lot to do with voices and choices. And there's a lot of external voices that you hear, positive and negative, and then you hear a lot of internal voices, both positive and negative. So I was trying to let them know that that the best way to predict your future is to create it. And the way you create it is you have to uh, make a choice on which voice you're going to listen to, whether you're going to be great, whether you're going to push yourself, whether you're going to quit or, or have fear and doubt. Once, whatever you choose, to, whatever voice you choose to listen to, then that's going to impact your decision. Then your, your, your decision is going to impact your right now. And obviously your right now predicts your future. It's the beginning of your future. So I kind of walk through those steps and that's actually how I'm writing volume three. So, uh, I, I, was, I, I just went over that process and, um, I got a, a very good response from coaches and players, but it all comes down to, uh, voices and choices. Uh, which voice are you going to listen to? And that's going to impact your decision. And then that's going to ultimately affect your right now and your future. Well, one of the kids that you that you spoke to uh, yesterday, Marcus, uh, I don't know if you noticed him in the crowd, but he was in Ohio State commitment. I mentioned him because two of your former compadres, man, they saw this kid. And when I say they let him have it to the point that I knew Marcus Ray would be proud. Now, they didn't do it quite like you, Marcus, uh, but they let him have it. This is because the kid, he came out in Ohio State shirt. So Cato June and Todd Howard said, man, you got to be kidding me. You you think you can walk in here with an Ohio State shirt and not have us say something to you? They told him uh, if he runs out of toilet paper, use his shirt. They told him good luck in life. Uh, Marcus, they, they let the young Ohio State, future Ohio State Buckeye, have it much like uh, much like Marcus Ray would have, I think, if you had seen the young man. Yeah, well, Cato and Todd Howard were sitting in the same room with me in 98 when they were freshmen and I was a fifth-year <laughs> senior. So that, that's great news to hear that they've carried on that tradition and they really uh, took to the lessons that were taught. But, you know, that that's all part of the rivalry. I think someone sent me a picture on Facebook or something, and, and I think I saw the kid. He took a picture of himself. Um, yeah, he on, uh, uh, I think at the Greek facility. and On the end. You know, he, yeah, I think he was in the end zone, and then he had on uh, some Ohio clothes. But, um, you know, sometimes kids that do that really want to go to Michigan, and Michigan probably didn't want them, so there's probably a chip on the shoulder. But I wish any 18-year-old well, 17- or 18-year-old well, but I know it's all, you know, and, and fun and in the rivalry and stuff, but you got to be smart, and hopefully uh, whoever that kid is, he will um, – be a factor in the rivalry. If you're going to be a guy like that, then, <laughs> and then and then you're just putting a target on your back. Also, David Boston did the same thing when he came on his visit, and that's where our rivalry began. It was actually on his visit, not camp, and then the rest is history. I got you now, Marcus. I you know I know you've been spending time uh, coaching uh, more so than anything else, but I'm curious, man. You're around coaches. You're around players. You're even around some of these these kids. I'm curious if you you've seen, heard anything that you can share anyway 
that is kind of was kind of notable, notable. Uh, you know, how a guy is looking, what he's saying, how a kid performed in camp. Any anything kind of jump out at you uh, this week? I know looking at some of those kids, Chris Wormley looked like he's in unbelievable shape. I saw Pee Wee Pipkins, who's down to as felt three oh five. You got some guys that are really at least looking the part from from what I can see out there. Yeah, I will say these young Michigan Wolverines, they are paying the price. They're making all the right sacrifices, and, and, it, and it shows externally. Um, yes, about well, two days ago, I was working with Amara Darbo, and I was surprised to see uh, his body frame and his structure, especially coming off of his injury. He looked like he was in great shape, about 210 pounds, and we, we threw the ball around just, just standing in place, throwing to one another for about 25 minutes, and we, and we spoke. And I was just amazed to see how long his arms were and, and just listening to him say how he can help the team this year and how he's excited. Um, you know, I saw Jared Wilson a few times. Obviously, Devin Funches looks great. All of these kids look great, man. And, um, you know, I have a great relationship with, with the entire team. And uh, we're always excited to see one another. And, and they noticed that I dropped a few, too. So we're all making a commitment <laughs> right. to uh, look good, play good, perform well. But, um, you know, Pee Wee Pipkin is my guy. We we actually talk a lot away from football. And, um, you know, he looks like he's in shape, as you stated. But I think overall this team looks like they're, they're at least serious or focused um, going into training camp. And speaking of focus, I mean, you're working with the defensive back, so you are working very closely with, with Roy Manning, who spent some time, some more time uh, this offseason clinicking with the uh, with the Bears and uh, and Brady's brother. He's gone around with a number of NFL teams. Uh, I, I'm curious what you what you've noticed in his in his coaching style and technique in the aftermath of of some of those some of those experiences. He's looking uh he's certainly looking more and more comfortable out there again from the outside looking in. Yeah, I would say from the time Roy was named cornerbacks coach until now, I think he's coaching with more confidence. I think he has more tools in his tool belt and he simplified um probably uh some of the things he tried to attempt earlier. You know, when you first get the job you have a bunch of ideas. I think he found what what actually worked for him. And also, he's been able to um, transfer that over to the assistant coaches also working at the camp. So, Roy, you know, he has taken command of the position. He's very knowledgeable. He does bring his own brand of enthusiasm. And, um, you know, he's been doing a lot of time walking around and evaluating, too, while the rest of us have been coaching. But I think Roy's going to do a great job. And uh, he understands defense. You know, there's there are football coaches, and then there are guys coaching football Roy Manning is a football coach. Got gotcha. you. Well, it, it certainly is one of those things where, when it comes to engaging the young man, uh, he he certainly seems to really, really be able to hit guys on on, on their level. They seem to identify with him. I guess that's what I'm looking for. That connection that a, a coach has with 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 the, with the player, he seems to be able to gain that pretty quickly. And you can see that even with with guys at camp. Yeah, Roy is a very approachable. Young man, and the other thing is too, uh, you know that he cares. You know that he cares. So whatever he's telling you is for a reason, it's for your own benefit, and it's for you to learn. And uh, and a lot of these kids uh, feel comfortable uh, taking his coaching and also talking to, with Roy, also with Kirk too. And uh, they they have a very good demeanor about themselves. I've been around a lot of coaches, and you know I'm a defensive back coach by trade myself, and and I and I picked up a few things from those guys. Um, you know, how to, you know, coach guys that are less talented or have more patience and, uh, you know, to actually teach. So it's been a pleasure so far, man, but I'm excited about uh, what Michigan secondary is going to look like, especially with Roy and Kurt both being uh, uh, in command. You know, Marcus, I, I missed you last week because I had an experience uh, being around a, a, a few coaches and, one in particular, I told a story about James Franklin where, uh, you know, a, a reporter friend of mine who I shall not name because I didn't ask him to te- to convey the story. Uh, but he approached James Franklin about an interview. Uh, James Franklin blew him off. It, it, it wasn't just blew him off. Kind of dismissed him as, as less than. It was like, wow, really? It's like that? And so uh, after, though, after he saw Mark D'Antonio kind of do an interview with this same guy, 
uh, James Franklin sent his sent one of his representatives over, said, "Okay, coach, I'll talk to you now," kind of thing. And it got me to thinking about something that that a scout told me. He said, "You know what you'll realize with with him is it's it's a a whole lot about the show." And I'm curious, you've been around a lot of coaches, man. I I guess in my experience, I've I've I feel like I've been around a lot of coaches that are really down to earth. Uh, but but with Penn State. Ohio State to a certain extent, man. It, it, it seems like maybe that 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 style, the the, the show, the pop and circumstance, as opposed to the, you know, the the nitty gritty, the meat and potatoes. That that's the that's the deal. Is it is it mostly about the show with a lot of coaches out there? I would say it is. No, no, I don't think with a lot of coaches it's about the show. Um, I think it's just about their mentality when they go from, let's say, a small-time coach to a big-time coach. Some guys think they have arrived once they get the job, even though they haven't won anything. And really, the stakes are higher. And people tr- – actually, there are people around you. you. You almost have to blame the guys around you that allow you to behave that mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. Um, uh, where, where they treat you like royalty because you're the head coach instead of treating you like a human being with respect for your position uh, or respect for your title. But – um you know, Franklin is new to the Big Ten. I'm not sure if he was that way at um, Vanderbilt, but I'm sure before he started winning, he took every interview he could get to, t- to help promote Vanderbilt football. But once you get to a major, uh, you know, top ten traditionally um, successful program, and then basically uh, everyone comes to you. And But, you know, Brady Hoke is not that way. Well, hey, you know, Michael said, I want to be clear, man, it's not like, you know, you got to take every interview. It was just the way he did. I mean, it was like child, get out of here type of thing that he that he did to my guy. And I was, you know, I told him when I talked to him, man, I wouldn't have done that. I, when he came back around and said, okay, we could do we could do the interview. And I was like, man, are you? I'd be like, man, are you kidding? And now well, he, he did the interview. I give him credit. He went ahead and, and did the interview with him anyway. I just I don't know that I could have done it. You know what? Sometimes, Sam, it does take for um, a third party to uh, validate your credibility. Um, in the media. So let's say if if D'Antonio takes the interview and then James Franklin, who's new to this Big Ten, to new probably to certain media outlets, he's probably like, well, if he'll take it and he's the Big Ten coach of the year, uh, won the Rose Bowl, yada, yada, Big Ten champions, then whoever that guy is that he's talking to, then I'll talk to him too. But if D'Antonio wouldn't have did that, then James Franklin probably wouldn't have taken that interview. That's where I think the problem comes in. But I, I, I think Franklin will learn that you know on the job as he goes. But as when you're a younger coach and you're in that type of situation, I'm not sure you always know how to go about uh, dealing with things like that. But it does always come if you always stick to trust and respect, commitment and accountability and things like that. Then normally you'll 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 take the high road the first time around. Gotcha. Last one for you, Marcus, so you can get back to work in the camp. Uh, and it, we're closing out NBA style with a couple of, of, of hot questions that we've dealt with on this show. Number one, LeBron James, you know, they four straight finals, but, uh, you know, lost this last one, lost that first one, lost this last one. Curious where you put him uh, in the pantheon of NBA greats. There are some that, that contend that despite this loss, he is the greatest player of all time. Uh, I still put him behind a number of guys, certainly Michael, uh, even Kobe, uh, just to name a few. I'm curious, uh, do you have him with or above those guys? And then, uh, you know, it's not always about who has the most titles. Uh, so, I, you know, I can I can go to the other side of that that coin because I think Greg Popovich, with this latest victory, man, I'm putting him ahead of Phil Jackson, who has 11 rings, because you have one guy that has done it over the course of time with the team that he built a team that aged and he still kept on top. So I put Pop on top. I'm curious where you are, Pop or Phil, and where do you have LeBron? I'm going to start with the latter. I'm going to disagree wholeheartedly with the Popovich and Phil Jackson um, stance that, that you've taken. I say that because I think I think Phil Jackson is the epitome of being able to manage great talent, whether he built it from the ground or not. He stepped in and showed the guys that came before him that you can do more with this same talent. So I forgot the other coach that was Popovich. there. Oh, uh, oh before uh, before Phil. Let's let's say before Phil Jackson got to the Lakers. Maybe it was West Fall. I can't remember. Whoever yeah, it was. Or Dale Harris was one of them. Dale Harris, yeah. Mm-hmm. He had Kobe and Shaq for at least three years. 
before Phil Jackson showed up. And then as soon as Phil showed up, that ship turns around. Mm -hmm. and, then th and I think he did the same thing uh, with uh, Michael Jordan, where Jordan was the best player in the league, probably, uh, at least top three with Bird and Magic in the 80s. And then uh, when Doug Collins was the coach, Jordan couldn't win. But Phil Jackson found a way to take the best players to the next level, to the next uh, stratosphere, but I, I give Popovich a lot of credit, and a lot of people say Phil can't coach without great players. Well, I think people tend to forget that Popovich coached uh, uh, Tim Duncan his whole career, who is the greatest power forward to ever play the game. So I'm still going to stick with Phil Jackson because he's done it at more than one place with different guys, and um, he was able to, to 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 take guys that were great and make them even greater, to make them probably the greatest. So and then then to go to your LeBron uh, LeBron point, um, I'll go with uh, Michael and Kobe at the top, Magic right in there too, uh, and I'm always going to stick with you know guys like Abdul Jabbar and Bird, even though it was a different era. I think LeBron is a great player. I think he's probably one of the top ten greatest to ever play. But to say he's the greatest, um, I, I think that's a bit premature. I think he's still young, and 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 there are a lot of guys that I would pick if I was on that level to play on my team before I would pick LeBron James. And um, and that's not to knock LeBron. I just, I just think that he was supposed to do more um, with the teams that he played on. And, and, and I don't think his supporting cast stepped up very much. I mean, we, all, we all saw that. But he is not the greatest player to ever play the game, in my humble opinion. I'm always going to stick with the Jordans, the Magics, and the Kobe's. I'll even throw Shaq in there, too. So I, I think I could probably name ten guys that 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 would be considered the greatest or the most dominant. I don't even think LeBron dominated this era. I think there were guys that were uh, KD and and Melo and all these guys are right there with LeBron. But when it was Kobe and Mike and Magic and Bird, they were clearly no debating at the top of uh, their craft when they played the game. Gotcha. Good stuff as always, Marcus. Get back to coaching, man. We'll talk to you next week. All right, Sam. I'll see you later. All right, that was Marcus Ray doing his thing down at the Michigan football camp, dressing the campers, helping mold and shape youngsters as they try to uh, not just follow their football dreams, but follow their life dreams as well as 824 on a Wednesday. We got to get to a break. When we come back on the other side, we'll talk to another former player who's doing a little coaching summer camp style these days. We're going to catch up with Zach Novak. Stay tuned for that here on the Michigan Insider on Sports Talk 1050 WTKA, the official voice of university.